uh, honors lit. We're talking about Pride and Prejudice. Tell me one thing, though, just whether you liked it or not, just something about it that you remember and something, something you mentioned manners. What, what, did, what did you notice? <clears throat> I would just notice how it's like all talking about just all the characteristics of love throughout the book of like dancing and stuff and how the different looks to the outside of like clothes of nature and all that. Yeah, it, <clears throat> part I liked about the book is that <clears throat> uh, the guy, uh, the guy lives in a big house, I forget his name. The guy she ends up marrying. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I get the title. Uh, she was prejudiced against him. He was definitely proud. Um, but, you know, she was able to, the part I remember is when she visited his house and she saw, she heard what other people said about him. She was, she didn't like the guy at all. You know, he he had ruined, you know, trying to ruin some a marriage of her sister and all this stuff. So she goes visit, gets out of the way, goes to his house, which I think is odd. They, they toured his house without him being there. And she saw him in a different light. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, who, which of y'all read that? I remember one of the themes was Welcome Mile in someone else's shoes. Um, well, she kind of did that. She went to his house. I imagine if I went to your house or you went to my house, We'd see us in each other in different light, or if there's somebody you don't know very well, if you went to their house, you'd see how they live. Um, you'd see what they're like. You hear what people say about them. You'd see their br brothers and sisters, maybe the neighborhood. I mean, that's that's what she did. She learned about this guy beyond her prejudice, and she turned he turned out to be the guy, Mr. Wright. You know, I just thought that that to me was was a, a great turning point. If I, if I ever get a question on AP about turning points. That would be one that I would, I think I could easily write about it. When she visited his house and saw and heard what the, sir, this guy's a great guy. People thought he was just the greatest guy. She said, are you kidding me? It's not the guy that I remember, but there was there were two sides of the story anyway. Yes, Kevin. I don't know, I didn't like it either. I thought it was too slow. <clears throat> yeah. I, give me something substantial though. The way they what? The way that they like talk to each other or about each other was just different than what I've read. Before. Like the way who talks to who? Just like everybody. Yeah. You mean just his just her like, style of writing? Yeah, the style of writing. Like, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Yeah. There's no way in the world, you know this, there's no way in the world we can judge their society by ours. Um, that, you know, it, we can't look back and say, man, they got all the, the, the way women are treated and everything, they, they got all that wrong. Uh, they may have gotten it wrong, but, you know, it's just impossible for us to judge them by our standards. Um, but I think women are, you know, and men, I, I, I think there's something universal about the way they treat, you know, the heart, whether it's the social, the social conditions are definitely different, but the way, uh, you know, the way she, she treated, that is Jane, um, she treated them as Jane Austen as human beings. I think that's, that's worth reading. Yes, Carl. Like what he just said.
Uh, why, why, why was that so important to value somebody? I mean, we don't do that in our society, do we? We don't. Women don't marry rich men, do they? Or um, that never happens, does it? Um, you know, I mean, that's that's the part that hasn't changed. We, yeah, we still people do marry others based on how much money they have, whether it's male or female. Um, and so, to me, that's that's still happening. It's just not institutionalized. And now it's, you know, somebody's choice rather than you, you have to marry somebody with money. Now, I think I want to marry somebody with money. Um, you know how that works. Uh, people are still attracted to money. And if you've got money and some looks to go along with it, that just sweetens the pot. But uh, how about it, um, <clears throat> David? Um, I, thought it was, I thought it was all right. I thought it was pretty obvious that, um, like Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy were gonna end up together. I just felt like it took too long for that to actually happen. Like, it's pretty obvious, uh, like kind of 50 pages in, and then it takes another 200 for them to actually get married. So it's like, I don't know, I just felt like it took too long. Um, and I just like, kind of made it less interesting. Cause you like, you know it's gonna happen, but it keeps getting, I felt like it kept getting like dragged out. Other than that, I thought it was like, her style of writing was really interesting. And like, it's a lot of dialogue, and you have to get like a lot of information from that. I thought that was pretty interesting. Like, you don't see that as much anymore. Yeah, and I, I really think this is the kind of book, <clears throat> I really didn't choose it for us to read. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's the kind of book that you have to, you, you have to, it'd be better if we read it at the end of the year than at the beginning of the year. Uh, yeah, we, we can handle the crucible. That's pretty obvious. The good guys, the bad guys, a lot of hysteria. This is this is all subtle, and you have to really appreciate her ability to bring people's... I like the father. I mean, he's he's comical, you know. Uh, <clears throat> the sister that ran away, you know, the one pr kind of promiscuous sister. I mean, these people are universal, uh, and they're comical. The mother, you know, the mother and the father weren't that very admirable people. Um, and, and I think you have to, it, it takes a while to appreciate those kinds of things. Julia. Um, <clears throat> enjoyed it a little bit. Um, but, and I liked all the characters except for the parent. Because the mother, she just was just set on getting her daughter married. And that was like the only thing she like really focused on. And like, if like the relationship or like, would go bad, she'd like go into hysterics about it and like wail about it. Like when um, Mr. Collins proposed to Elizabeth, she got really upset with Elizabeth afterwards because they, she wasn't going to get married to Mr. Right. Collins. So. Uh, <clears throat> it, it annoyed you that she was so wanting to get her <clears throat> children or girls married. We were reading <clears throat> Beowulf yesterday, you remember two years ago? If you remember the character Wilthiel, she's the wife of Hrothgar, and her main concern, guess what her main concern is? It's her children. I mean, here's a book written 700 AD versus a book written 1820 AD, and yet the mothers, their chief concern are their children. Now she's comical and kind of silly, but what is her concern? It's no different than Wilthiel. It's Will Thal trying to get her kids protected because if the next guy that's king might just kill them. And so that's all she's doing. And and in that society, the women have very little options, you know, and we don't we're, we're, you know, we don't agree with that society, but if you were an hour in it, we'd do the same thing. Okay, this is the way it works. I'm gonna make the best of it. Uh, how about it, Elizabeth? And I can completely understand because I felt the same way when I was your age. And that's why when I read it again for the first time in 50 years, we did, we put it on several years ago at Caldwell, and <clears throat> it took forever. You know, it was like this thing, they, they did every, you know, like every scene. This was 15 years ago when I was first here. Uh, and I thought, my 
my goodness. And of course, there are a lot of aspects of listening to a play. You can't hear it very well and that sort of thing. But that was my impression. And I thought, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read that again. And yet when I read it last summer, it just kind of all opened up and I, I appreciated it. Um, how about it, uh, John? Um, I never really liked the book from our home, but I thought it was kind of interesting how like at first Elizabeth didn't, was like so optimistic and like resistant about marrying Mr. Darcy that at the end she, she like overcomes like all the rumors that she heard about him. And the prejudice. Yeah, there's all sorts of prejudices. You know, we, we, we just see it in one, there's basically one kind of prejudice in our society, but there are always people prejudiced. We're all prejudiced, you know, toward our family. We like our family better than other people. We think our, you know, people, our brother, will defend our brother or whatever. Um, and so she had to overcome those prejudices to see the truth. To me, that's a universal thing. It's what, you, what, what they had to do in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, they had to overcome racial prejudice. Well, this is class prejudice or gender prejudice. Um, it's never a good thing, but it's natural. I mean, we, it's part of our sin nature. Uh, Madison. Um, I didn't really like it because it was kind of slow, but I like how often shows how that the wealthy class of the person in the book is an obstacle in the way. Is or is not? Is. It is. Say that last part. The stories and lots of dialogue, which I like. Yeah, another thing you made me think of is the value and importance of a family and marriage. Just think that's not even an issue. I mean, we're talking about marriage is passe. Marriage is old-fashioned. There are all sorts of alternatives to traditional marriage. And yet this book, you just said it ends well. And I think part of her message was that's because the family structure is intact at the end. Um, family is so important. People are gonna people are gonna find a family one way or the other. Um, they're gonna get a family. It's just what was that family gonna look like? If we don't have the traditional family, people will create a different kind of family. Maybe you know, obviously it could be a gang. It could be anything that you people people need to be a part of a society, and we we, we have those choices. It, it's it's gonna happen. And in that case, it works. Their society works. Yeah, Matt. Um, I thought the book was all right. Um, and I found that um, the contrast bet uh, between expectation and reality was pretty interesting. Like how in the beginning, um, like Darcy, he looked down upon Elizabeth because like he expected her to like be like lower status and like um, not what kind of status? Time. Like what? What'd you say? S something status? Lower, lower status. Status. Lower status, gotcha. And then um, also Elizabeth looks down on Darcy because of his higher social status um, and what she expects him to act like. But in reality, once they actually meet each other, um, they end up falling in love. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he was pretty mean. He was pretty proud, and he was. He admitted that. He changed. He confessed to it. That's another thing to look for when you read books is what changes people? The best books are, peop are books that show change and redemption, in other words. Somebody wrote a, one of your summer books. That was a big deal. I can't remember where, I mean, most books have that in it. I can't remember one book in particular where redemption was a major theme of it. That's a major thing to look for. And that's, again, that's worth noting as we go forward. The book we're about to read, I'm gonna show you in just a minute, has that theme. Yeah. Um, I thought the book was like okay. It wasn't too bad. Uh, but one thing that really stuck out to me was like the role of reputation and how much like power it possessed. Um, like whoever you would marry would greatly affect your reputation. What family you were born into like gave you a reputation. What class you were a part of gives you a, rep a reputation. And we can even see with like Darcy that because of his reputation, that's the reason why. Elizabeth became more fond of him. So I would just try to really comment 
Is there anything wrong with it? I mean, it's inevitable, right? You, you have a reputation. You do. All of you do. Um, they, how can you avoid? People talk about you. They, they, they make judgments about you. Um, I mean, it's not. It's impossible not to have a reputation. You know, uh, you wouldn't you rather have a good one than a bad one? Um, so, I mean, reputation is the theme of that book. What people think of you might not be what you really are. What can you do about that? I mean, you can't control what other people. And of course, you got it worse because people are building and creating reputations online. Maybe it's worse. I don't know. People have always talked. So, um, how do you handle reputation? I mean, you know, they, they even have a company that, or more than one that says my online reputation was ruined, and I had to go to this company and they had to rehabilitate my reputation. Um, that can ruin a, a company. Is, is your rep what people are saying about you? Um, seems like that's a pretty legitimate topic for a book. And she, you're right. That's kind of what this book is about. Todd. Very, again, is, is, is that all is that much different from today? I mean, really, think about it. Isn't that a major reason why some people get married? Maybe a lot of people. You know, you're not going to marry a poor guy. You want to marry a guy that can take care of you, right? Your parents think that. You wouldn't say that. You don't want a guy, you probably don't want a guy to take care of you. But I promise your parents are thinking that. You know, they want you to marry some guy that can provide for you. Um, so that hadn't changed much. I mean, it's a 150-year-old book. That's a 200-year-old book. Um, and they're still, de is, is, you know, is, is old-fashioned as it is, they're still dealing with the same topics that, that you are. Um, any last word for this? Um, anyway, the book we're gonna read next, more stuff happens, I promise you. Um, I'd argue maybe that Pride and Prejudice still is a better book. Um, I just have a, I have a real appreciation of it now. Anything she writes, I have appreciation for. I need those. There's a clean uh, basket over there. Make sure you stay put together your names on it. Um, and please put it in there. You can grab a copy of that book, too, on the table. It's that what tall stack right there. No, just one, because like my quotes. It's a book. Let me uh, let me remind you that let me remind you that next week we're going to have a second quiz and I'm I'm grading ninth grade papers. This is the hardest part of the year besides every other part of the year. Um, I'm joking. It's the hardest part of the year besides exams because we have this summer reading stuff that I have to go through um, and I'm I'm working on the ninth grade, but I'm, I hadn't forgotten your quizzes from last week. I'll get to you, those to you this week. Once I can get over this hump, uh, you have a bunch of grades already, uh, which is important. You have a test grade that you got yesterday. Um, we'll be a test on the, the romanticism unit and then one on the book you just picked up. Notice it does look exactly like the poetry book with a little less color to it, so you're gonna have to be careful when you grab it. Um, so we're gonna start there. Um, but that is next week. Right now it's scheduled for the 28th. 
at uh, terms to quiz and I don't I, I just I don't know that we can sustain having a quiz every two weeks um, I, I'd like to give quizzes on this just to make sure that you're reading um, so I just I don't know how we will what I want to do is be faithful though with those words that's really important that you know them um, that you study them and that you you know that you're quizzed on them so uh, that is one of my my goals this year is to make sure we go through that glossary and you are, are uh, acquainted with those words uh, the other thing that that we, we're gonna do that we're gonna do poetry we're gonna write and we're gonna do this we're gonna read um, yeah I don't know how well you read the book uh, it's hard to tell how much how well you knew it um, but that's just the way it is at least, at least it was an opportunity here we're going to read every word of it, and we're going to talk about it. The name of the the title of the book is "The House of the Seven Gables," and I want to I want to show you or give you some some notes on this. Um, so get out something to take notes with. I'm going to go ahead and start the clock in terms of this book. I'm going to give you the first, uh, let me double check. I think it's seven chapters, one through seven. I'm going to give you a week to read it. Um, it's probably less than 100 pages, I don't know, but it's not easy reading. I think you'll find it more interesting than the book you just read. Uh, but the name of the book is The House of the Seven Gables. If you look at the cover, the picture on the cover, I need to double check. Yeah, this is the actual, um, this is the actual, let me check it out. Uh, this is the, 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 the house that inspired the title and the book. The house, um, it's just a house. Um, but the, it's the things, of course, that go on in the house that matter. Uh, do you know what the word house could mean other than a literal house? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the Bible it talks about the house of David or, um, you know, in, in British royalty and you know, each one of the houses or the, the families. So this is not only about a physical structure, it's about a family. And I promise you that's the kind of thing that they could ask you on the AP exam. Uh, so some background, you can, you can you know, just write these down quickly. I think it's anything you can know about the, the author um, is, is going to help you. All right, so he was born on the 4th of July, 1804, in Salem, Massachusetts. Hmm. When have we heard of Salem, Massachusetts? Yeah, uh, the man's name is Hawthorne. And where have we heard the name Hawthorne before in Salem, Massachusetts? Remember one of the judges, Danforth and Hawthorne? Well, they were real people, and he was actually, this, this uh, Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne, was related to that Hawthorne. Um, he added the W to his name, and I don't know how that John Hawthorne pronounced it. I imagine it was pronounced pretty much the same. But he added the W, didn't do much changed the you know the name much but he did that to sort of separate himself from the Hawthorne and the Salem Bridge Draw. Um, he graduated from Bowden College. Did anybody in here read Gods in general? Somebody did. Um, does that re re ring a bell, Bowden College? Those were all Chamberlain? Yeah, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the hero, and there's more than one of the of Battle of Gettysburg for the North was a uh, professor at Bowden College. Um, yeah, and he was even in the list. Look at some of the people they produced. Franklin Pierce, the president, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and the Civil War hero, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. 
Uh, that's a little bit of, about his background. Uh, I can always count on the fact that as sophomores, you would have read the Scarlet Letter. I don't think Dr. Bedsell had to read it. Um, I love what he's teaching, frankly. I love the fact that you read Milton and some other things. <laughs> that would be one that I, I, I wish you had read. Um, but you know, I, I think, I don't know. I like this book better, actually, um, of the two that, that we typically teach in high school. I like uh, House of the Seven Gables. Uh, yeah, he, he wrote other books. He wrote those two. Those are the most famous ones. Um, Fanshawe, never read it. I spent 12 years in Salem where he wrote Twice Told Tales. These are a series of short stories which uh, I, I used to teach from some of those. Notice he was a uh, he was a uh, a bureaucrat, kind of like Chaucer in England. He worked for you know most of his life as a bureaucrat. Chaucer did and wrote. Um, same thing with uh, with Hawthorne. He was a uh, bureaucrat. Worked in the um, in the customs house there. If you ever read the um, Scarlet Letter, the first uh, chapter of that it's really a pre chapter takes place in the Boston Custom House. Uh, and then he spent seven months at Brook Farm. Uh, I remember studying about this in high school. It was a utopian communal uh, farm. Uh, early days, early hippies. We, I don't even know if you remember what those were, but people um, after the 1950s, people started uh, living off the land, young people, and that was the drug culture started, and the, the sexual revolution. Uh, it's quite a legacy they left us. Uh, yeah, we're still we're still having to deal with the uh, consequences of that. Um, we'll study transcendentalism. I've defined that for you earlier. It's a form of romanticism. Uh, it's it's kind of a philosophy slash religion very unorganized. I mean, it, it's not, they didn't have a, a strong set of beliefs or anything. Um, in terms of his short stories, if you know Edgar Allan Poe and have read any of those, uh, those probably are a little bit edgier maybe to some degree than uh, than his, but they're very similar. Uh, Hawthorne wrote stories like that. Like if you think of the Black Cat or the, um, the Telltale Heart, um, but Hawthorne wrote similar stories. He, he wrote a story about a, a man who, who grew a plant, that the plant he was able to use to keep people young. Um, and he wrote one about the Fountain of Youth uh, it was just kind of some crazy thing. It's, it's, he wrote one about a husband whose wife had one little physical flaw about her, and uh, he couldn't stand it that she wasn't physically perfect. Of course, he goes to all these extremes to get rid of it, and in doing so, he kills her. Um, I mean, that's to me, that's a, a parable of our modern times. Physical beauty is, is worship, and um, yeah, a lot of mad scientists in Hawthorne. Now, you don't get any of that here in this book, but you do get the supernatural, which makes it fun to read. Somebody mentioned, I think it was Elizabeth, said something about there's no supernatural in um, Pride and Prejudice. Well, we make up for it in this book, because there is a, a supernatural element. Uh, he was married. Uh, he moved to Concord. Um, he was a friend of, uh, well, didn't say friend, but he, he may have known him as a friend, uh, Emerson's old house. Uh, he works in the custom house, and in 1850, he published the Scarlet Letter. I'm gonna give you the title of five books now. 
This is the first time it won't be probably it won't be the last time you hear this. Between 1850, all right, after you write this, I'm going to ask you to, to write these, these down. Between 1850 and 1855, five of the greatest books ever written by an American were published. The five five year period. Uh, these five books are still considered among the greatest books ever written, and they were published essentially all at the same time. And I want to give you those five books. I don't remember all the dates, but we'll start with the Scarlet Letter, 1850. Do you have any idea what the other four might be? We're talking about some of the greatest books ever written. American authors, 1850s. Um, British. Okay. It's kind of a trivia question, but I think it's important. All right, so let me give you the other four. Um, one is The Scarlet Letter. One is Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And I don't remember the exact date for that. Uh, all right. One is Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harry Beecher Stowe. You ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of that? Okay, it's, it was, it dramatized slavery in America. Uh, one was Walt Whitman's uh, uh, Leaves of Grass. Wait, what was that? Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. They got Scarlet Letter, Moby Dick, Leaves of Grass, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and the other, the the other one, I think it was 1854, was Walden by Henry David Thoreau. W-A-L-D-E-N. Right, these are all written, and notice they're not all novels. One's poetry, one's essay. Um, the other three are not. Well, yeah, they're all novel. Other three are. So that's kind of a trivia question. I might ask them for a quiz, uh, for extra credit or something. Oh. It's hard to tell right now what you know, people always ask, so is, is the next great American novel been written? Is you, you can't tell right now. You have to wait. You know, it, has to, it has to survive several years. I don't read too many contemporary books, uh, but we'll have to see what your, what your children are reading or grandchildren are reading in School. All right, so 1851, House of Seven Gables. You, you notice that wasn't in that list. I think it's just as good as Scarlet Letter, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't. He didn't make that list. Uh, Blythdale Romance, and um, you know he he served in, in England. I mean in Europe and in England, uh, and died in Concord in 1864. Um, 
this is really uh, a tale of two families. Uh, it says the house of seven gables, uh, but that really includes two families, not just one. One of the families are known as the Pensions. Uh, so uh, the, the first chapter, you may not appreciate it the first time you read it, but it contains most of the supernatural elements of the story in the first chapter, which you're going to be reading for next week. You're going to read the first seven chapters for, uh, what, Tuesday? We can make it Wednesday, because you have a quiz on Tuesday. Okay, so Colonel Pynchon, he's the original, sort of the original character in the story. He lived during the Salem Witch Trials, 1692, and he, uh, he wanted some land. If you recall from the book, The Crucible, that was the motivation of uh, Mr. Putnam. It was the motivation of Giles Corey. Uh, they wanted other people's land, and so they were able to use the witch trials to procure that land. And that's what happens in this book. Uh, the book takes place in modern, which would have been the 1850s, modern uh, uh, Massachusetts. But the background goes all the way back uh, about 200 years. Um, all right, so Colonel Pynchon is the original Pynchon. Gervais Pynchon owned the house for 37 years, about 100 years before the present action of the story. So his story comes out. You'll hear about Colonel Pynchon in the first chapter, and then later in the book, you'll hear the story of Gervais Pynchon. Gervais had a daughter named Alice. And uh, you'll notice that her name comes up because she has, there are some flowers growing on the house and they call them uh, Alice's uh, pension. I mean, Alice's uh, flowers. I forget what kind they are. <clears throat> then you have the modern day Judge uh, Jaffrey pension. So these people live in the current day that the story's taking place. These are ancestors, um, including Alice. She's one of the ancestors. Okay, so Judge Jaffrey Pynchon is still living when the story begins. <coughs> he has a sister, Hepzibah. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a cousin, not a sister. And she has a brother named Clifford. So Hepzibah's brother and Clifford spent 30 years in jail falsely accused of murdering somebody. And then you have Phoebe, which is uh, Hepzibah's young cousin, probably in her 20s at the, at the older. So these are background all the way to Alice, and then these, these characters actually are in the story, the present stories. Uh, the judge, Hepzibah, Clifford and Phoebe. All those are pension. They're the people that live in the house and own the house. But there's another family.
And here's the other family. You don't have time to really write all this, but you can write their name down. Um, the other family are the Mulls, M-A-U-L-E. And there's, there's several Mulls in the family, I mean, in the book. The original Mull was Matthew Mull. His son, Thomas, actually built the house of Seven Gables. And has a, he has a son named Matthew Mall, young Matthew Mall. And then at the very end of the story, I, I hate to reveal this to you, but maybe you'll forget it, try to forget it. But one of the characters at the end, uh, in, in the current day story is, is also related to the mall. So the story is basically these two families, and so please, if you have a copy of it, please start reading. Um, you know, usually I, I do give quizzes on these things. Um, so that's going to be primarily your homework for the rest of the year, is reading the books that we have. So please, I expect you to really put quality time into it. All right, we will see you tomorrow. Yeah.